us for the weekly Thursday training call. Uh, today's going to be a bit of a special call. I've got uh, a special guest, Jim McQuaig from Churchill Mortgage with us today. He's going to be providing some color on the cash versus mortgage strategy that we're going to be discussing. Uh, I'm going to give you the nuts and bolts on how to put it together, but uh, we're just going to kind of chat back and forth. So if you have questions for either myself or Jim, please do enter them into the questions area of the GoToMeeting toolbar. And then as we see those come in, we'll, uh, we'll try and address them for you. So Jim, let me go ahead and introduce you first. Uh, Jim, again, thanks for joining us today. I know you have uh, worked with a lot of CPAs, financial planners in the past, and you've got some really good strategies built around, uh, around this type of presentation. So we really appreciate you offering some color on this. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Glad to do it. Right on. Well, let's uh, let's dive right into it. You guys should all be seeing my screen right now. Um, so the the first thing is kind of want to pre-frame this a little bit. Um, Jim, can you give us a little color on what is the cash mor versus mortgage strategy and uh, what types of borrowers do you usually end up using this type of uh, presentation with? Well, I mean, I think it's the pure 100% cash versus maximum mortgage is, you know, that one might be a little bit of an odd situation, but I think it probably relates to almost everybody as they look to make a decision buying a house, how much to put down if they have that option. And so uh, what this allows you to do is show them, uh, you know, the, the differences between uh, having, the, having that money available for other things, whether they be other investment opportunities or set aside for, uh, you know, a rainy day, you know, emergencies versus putting it into the equity in the home uh, and, and what the trade-off is there. So I think it really has application to almost everyone, um, not always just purely the, you know, the rich guy that wants to take his money and do the arbitrage thing. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So, well, let's dive in Let's dive into actually creating this report real quick. So um, for those of you who are brand new to Edge, uh, when you're doing one of these strategies, you want to be able to show the long-term effects of both options. So in order to do that, you're always going to go through the New Client tab here. So I'm going to click on New Client, and I'm going to make this a marketing report, and I'm just going to call it CAS versus Mortgage. And then as we go through the screens, there's a lot of information that you can actually bypass, uh, especially if you're not taking specific information from your borrower. But one of them is definitely going to be, you got to select the purchase a new home goal when you get to the goal screen. This is going to eliminate the need for a current mortgage in your, in your presentation. It's also going to make it so it doesn't ask you all the questions about it. So after you've toggled that box, you're going to continue through. And then you're going to enter your purchase price. So let's say 350 And the last part here is it's up to you on whether you want to show the tax benefit for uh, for each equation. For today's discussion, I don't think tax benefit would necessarily come into play quite so much. So I think we're just going to focus on the mortgage elements themselves. So I'm going to go straight past this and head into products. Now, product one is going to be our purchase with cash. And this is not a refi, so I'm going to leave it toggled at no. And it's not a current mortgage. And by the way, you should never actually have to check that current mortgage box. The only time you would end up using that is when you're trying to resubordinate a second lien or something like that. But in those kind of cases, you're actually going to use the copy button to copy the, uh, the current mortgage scenarios from the assumptions area. So that'll automatically check that box for you. So just kind of a red flag for you brand new users. Don't check this box. Allow the copy button to do it if you're going to do a resubordination. All right, so on this cash purchase, obviously we're going to have them bring in the whole thing. So our down payment is 350, which means we've got a zero loan amount, zero rate, zero term. That's that's what we want. Now there's obviously not going to be any closing costs that are going to be associated with this, so we're going to leave that empty. And then we're going to go straight over to the monthly costs. They're still going to have hazard insurance and uh, they're still going to have property tax, so we're going to go ahead and pop those figures in. And then we're going to add another product. Now our next product here is going to be a 20% down, 30 fixed. And we've got the same purchase price, of course, so 350. We'll go ahead and pop in our 20%, so that's going to give us our correct base loan amount. And then we'll put in the rate that we can get them right now, as well as the term. Now at this point, I am going to include closing cost details for this transaction, so I'm going to pull one of my templates in. And let's see here. I think my conventional has a good set of fees in there. There we go. And I'm actually going to eliminate the reserves on this one because I'm going to allow the system to do it for me. This is a new feature that we've just added recently. So I want you all to be able to see how this is done. 
So I'll hit apply to loan. And then when I get to the last part, I'm going to input my monthly hazard insurance and my taxes, just like I did on the first example. There's not going to be any MI because I'm, uh, I'm doing an 80% loan to value here. But I want to uh, assess the reserves. So if I need, let's say, three months of hazard insurance reserves and two months of tax reserves, and then I also want to collect a 12-month premium for the hazard insurance, all I have to do is enter it right here. And when I go back to the left, you'll see that inside the closing cost details, it's already pre-calculated those for me. So it, it added three line items for me, my hazard insurance reserves, my taxes reserves, and my hazard insurance 12-month premium. Now, once I'm done with all those guys, I am finished with the loan product area. So now it's time to go to the reinvestment screen, which is where you're going to make it all happen. This is where the comparison becomes an apples to apples look at cash flow. Now, when we go in here, we're going to hit adjust reinvestment strategy. And as you can see, it shows the cash to close for each one of these options here. Now, if it's going to cost them about $75,000 cash to close for uh, for this 20% down option, that means they're going to have about 275, maybe 274 left in their bank account afterwards. So we're going to put that right here. Now we want to use equal rates of return between these two options because uh, we don't want to have any questions about, you know, can you, you, you could probably just fudge the numbers on this and make everything look the way you want it to look. So let's try and keep everything apples to apples here. Now, as we continue to go through the presentation, remember that edge is live and dynamic, so you can change things on the fly. So when you first start your conversation with your borrower, you may be talking about say this 4% rate of return that I'm using here. But as you go further in the conversation, you may indicate, well, what would happen if you're actually able to get a 5% rate of return? How would it look? You could come back in, make the change, and then as soon as you hit one of the right or left arrows inside Edge, it's going to trigger a save, which means the live version of the report is going to show that new investment balance. Now, we've accounted for the down payment difference by entering the investment balance here on our 20% on our, uh, down. But now we need to account for the difference in monthly cash flow. So 14, 18, 72, we're going to put that in as a monthly payment. And that's going to go on the buy with cash side. Now, as you can see, they're going to accrue wealth either way. Now, one of the things that's critical about the strategy is understanding the idea of liquidity. Now, in both options, they, they are going to gain a significant amount of wealth at 15 years, but the buying with cash option relies on the borrower to actually put this money away every month and allow it to grow. Whereas the 20% down, they're putting the entire chunk that they have left into this investment account and then just allowing that to grow going forward, which means the borrower doesn't have to focus on making those additional payments to their investment account every single month. They're just going to allow that money to grow. Now, as you can see, we are looking at a 15-year point here. But what if we took this down to, say, five years? And when we do that and go back into our adjust reinvestment strategy, you can see that it automatically updates what your investment is at the five-year point. So at this point, you can actually have this conversation about liquidity. If you wanted to put all your money into owning the property right now and then keep pushing that monthly savings back into your account, at the five-year point, you've got about 95 grand in your account. Again, relies on the borrower to continue making that investment payment every month. Whereas on the 20% down, you've got money left over that's sitting in an account, and it's actually much greater at the five-year point, so you have far more liquidity. Now, Jim, let me bring you in at this point, because I know that this was a point you, you and I discussed yesterday in, in quite some detail. Now, when you're talking to a borrower about this type of strategy, what, what type of points are you pointing out for them uh, regarding what they can do with the money, what the cash flow is going to look like, and, and what kind of options would you be talking to your financial planner or CPA partner about? Yeah, I mean, I think one of, if you're talking with a, with a financial planner partner, you know, one of the things that I always ask them is of the of the folks that you do um, plans for, you know, up front, what percentage of the people you do plan for that you, you actually implement 100% of the plan for them? And the answer, of course, is usually no, uh, zero uh, because there's always limitations that people have. You know, there's always holes in their plan. And so I think in a situation like this, you're able to show your referral source that there's an opportunity to, um, you know, to fill more of the holes initially. Now, kind of the flip side of that argument is, gee, if, if someone has this big chunk of money, 
um, how can they how, how are they going to resist the urge to go out and blow that money or to make bad decisions with it or whatever and and that is that is somewhat valid I guess um, except for the fact that you know in a lot of cases people have have you know they've saved that money so clearly they were able to do it to get to that point um, and one of the things that you mentioned I think is very valid is who's to say that if they pay cash for the house they're actually going to take that monthly savings and, and do responsible things with that you know from an investment standpoint so it really kind of gets down individually to each person and seeing what their habits are and, and you know we're kind of uniquely positioned as mortgage advisors to be able to look at the you know the credit profile, their their um, savings profile and asset uh, accumulation, and be able to make some pretty pretty um, accurate determinations about you know what what kind of person we got sitting in front of us and who's likely to do what. I mean, it seems like that's it's pretty easy for us to tell that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I think it it can go either way on this mortgage or no mortgage, and I think by showing them this, you're giving them a very clear um, some clear data to make a decision from instead of just going from their gut feeling or some old wives tale or something that someone else has told them they can actually look at the real the real data which is nice excellent excellent thank you Jim so now the next step here is once you've got your analysis completed your reinvestment strategy is ready to go uh, there's there's a couple of things I want to point out to you on this on this analysis summary because it it looks kind of scary the buy with cash option as you can see going down the line yeah it, it costs them more every month when we look at our short term interest savings obviously the buy with cash there's no interest accrual there so basically they're saving money on interest versus this this new loan however when you're positioning this with your borrowers what you're really looking to isolate is as we were talking about earlier the liquidity. And the best way to show that in the long-term section here is going to be total net worth. Total net worth is a combination of their total equity at this five-year point plus any liquid assets they have. Now, you can see that their net worth is roughly the same between the two options. But when we get to the live report, I'm going to show you that there's actually a striation in this graph that's going to show you the difference between the assets and equity. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So when you're positioning this with a borrower, and Jim, I could use your help on this one. If, if you're sending this to one of your borrowers and you're, you're starting the conversation, you've already included a financial planner, and you're talking about what this, what this presentation entails, uh, obviously this 60-month this period, how, how, are you, how are you talking about this or are you completely avoiding this in order to focus strictly on the net worth element? Well, I think, I think the 60-month period, the, the short-term savings side of it, is uh you know it's less of it's kind of it doesn't i don't know all all you're really showing is interest savings there which is i don't know from a from a financial planning standpoint or trying to indicate where people are at i don't i don't know if that has a real strong um uh, application really clearly not as much as the net worth number and i love the way you guys have made that change with the two different colors there because it's so visual now to show people uh, what they're creating for themselves from the standpoint of liquidity. It's really, it's, it's really good. So I think that's where the discussion really is at. And I think the information in the short-term savings in this example is really, I don't know, it's, it, maybe it's interesting, but that's about it. I, you know, right. I, don't, I don't think it's real. I don't think it has a lot to do with what you're talking about. Excellent. That's that's where I was going too. So a key point to take away here is the total cost analysis. It's it's very dynamic. You can show a lot of different types of transactions against each other. Uh, but one thing to, to remember is that that short term savings area, that's strictly looking at interest, like Jim was saying. So it may be kind of inconsequential for this particular discussion. If they're considering going with the mortgage at all, it's because they might be worried about liquidity. You know, they might have a plan, a five-year plan that says, hey, you know, my son's going to be going to college and I need to have a chunk of money that I can still use for that kind of thing. So why not keep it liquid, put it in this larger investment and allow it to just continue to accrue so that when I need it, it's there. So when you're pitching this to your clients, when you're sending this out and when you're doing your videos, the parts that you're going to touch on are one, you are going to show them what the mortgage looks like. Yeah, it, it is going to cost you seventy six grand to close here. That's going to pull a little chunk out of your savings right now. But the difference is 
while you've got 20% equity going forward, you've also got a huge liquid asset going down the line. And again, we're keeping this at very short terms. We're keeping it at five years for both uh, the short term, which again, you're not, you're not really even going to touch on. But the five-year plan for the long term becomes really important. Now, obviously, if we were to push this long term out all the way to the end of the term, 30 years, we're going to find that these are roughly equal. They're, they're going to end up with about the same amount of liquidity at 30 years uh, and the same amount of net worth. But the critical factor here is what happens in the interim? Do they have money that they can they can depend on during this time that they, you know, this short term planning that they're doing? So as you're talking about this with your borrowers, the, the two points you're going to look at is you're going to look at this top left and you're going to look at the bottom right. So if I was to explain this to a borrower, I think the first place I would start is I would have that discussion about net worth. And I would talk about the liquidity at five years. I would talk about this green part being their equity if they bought with cash. And then this orange part being how much liquid assets do they have? Then I would show them the more info section. And the reason I would show them this is I, I just want them to see the numbers next to each other. And I might highlight these. I want them to see that they're an even rate of return. But I'm also going to let them know that in order to get this buy with cash option to work, they would have to keep contributing that monthly savings, that $14.19 every single month into that investment account. So that would probably be my transition point where I would direct them towards the more info section at the top left. Now, the key part here is going to be your reinvestment grid. So you're going to show them things like, and I would highly recommend highlighting these, show them the rate of return, show them what the, the initial investment balance is, and show them what their monthly payment is on, on each, either side. And then, of course, you want to highlight the totals here because those are going to be the most important factors to discuss with your client. Now, this leads to another discussion, and that's do you know your client's goals correctly? Now, part of the edge wizard is you're collecting information about your client regarding their future goals, their current, uh, their current financial picture. You want to know more about them. And, and as Jim alerted to earlier, you know, you, as mortgage originators, you, you have a really good view into the spending habits of what your client is doing, the saving habits, and you can make a pretty good guess as to how they're going to do this going forward. Are they capable of actually putting that fourteen nineteen away every single month back into that investment account? Or does having the extra cash on hand, you know, maybe give them the option to, to be a little less thrifty? You know, is it... Uh, are you noticing some poor spending habits in their past in which, you know, putting a lump sum in would actually be a little bit safer for this client because they don't have to rely on making those extra payments. So after I've, after I've finished touching on that, and again, those are only two places I'm really going to talk about. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about my client's goals again. So when we're producing something like this, when we're putting this presentation together and you're sending it out to either, uh, you know, a marketing group or you're sending it out to an individual client, Make sure you've got a video on this, because if you were to send this out just exactly as is, you know, I'm a borrower and I don't understand what this means. I'm going to look at it and go, wow, it cost me fourteen hundred dollars more to, uh, to to buy a house with a mortgage. And then it's going to cost me sixty five grand in interest over five years. Why would I even bother doing this? Because they're not going to understand that the net worth is the most important part. So absolutely critical when you're sending one of these out, include a video. Now, some basic parameters for video guidelines very simple it's only really a four-step process here and you want to try and keep your video under about two minutes for for best effects and the first step is introduce yourself you know why are you sending the, this presentation you know did you meet with them have you already had a discussion with them bring up something that's that's relative to your reason for contact the next part cross sell your referral partner if you are working with a cpa or financial planner on this presentation or working you know with this client's cpa or financial planner you want to make sure and toss him a bone throw him some kudos you know talk about how how he's helped you know hundreds of thousands of people with uh with, with stabilizing their their financial portfolio something like that but get a little bit of detail from them and uh, beef them up a little bit because it's going to come back around for you now, the third part is the explanation of the report. So you're going to explain just these, these top left and bottom right quadrants. And you're going to advise the client that those are the most important parts of this report. And again, keep it short. Touch on just very top level points because your call to action is what's going to prompt them to have a further discussion about this. And that brings us to the last and final step got to have a good call to action. You know, it's, it's always great to say, you know, something like, you know, if you have any questions, give me a call, but that's not a call to action. 
That's asking them a question. You want to make sure that at the end of your presentation, they know that it is imperative that they contact you to find out more information. So be a little bit, a little bit more forceful with that call to action. Something like, I know you're going to have questions about this when you watch this. Please call me as soon as you're done so we can schedule time to discuss this in more detail. It says the exact same thing as the previous statement but it's not a question. So it's gonna make your, your presentations a little bit more effective, especially if you're doing a marketing presentation like this one, where it's, you know, it may not be geared at a specific borrower. You wanna make sure that whoever is viewing it, even if you've never talked to them, understands that the type of mortgage advice that you can provide is, is only really attainable when they talk to you. You know, they can't just look at a graph and make a decision. They need to have your mortgage advice. Your expertise needs to follow your presentation. Jim, any, any comments on video production and, and what type of, uh, uh, I guess, what, what type of extras do you throw in yours and, and what, what are some of the effective tools you use when, when doing video recording? Really, really not a lot. I mean, I think, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. Brevity is important. Call to action endorsing the referral source. One thing I wanted to comment on that you talked about was the um, was the rate of return piece and the net worth. And you can see when you're looking at it here, they're very similar. In fact, the having a mortgage piece is, actually, is a little less. One of the things that I would mention, and, and this is where it helps to really know the philosophy of the referral source, uh, because you, you want to be careful here, and, and you don't want to use what I'm about to say in a manipulative way, because you, you really could. If uh, if you chose to, and I, and, I, and I don't think it's I don't think it's right to do that, but it is it is important I think to the to the extent that the referral source, if they're a financial advisor, is is advising the client this way, and that's that a mortgage, particularly a fixed rate mortgage like this, can really be used as a hedge if you think that. And for instance, uh, inflation is going to be going up in the future, which would mean interest rates are going up. Well, if interest rates are going up, typically rates of return on investments go up as well. So if you, if you look at that, it says 4% rate of return. If you think over the course of the next 10 years we're going to see some inflation, then certainly you would see that 4% rate go up in, in normal circumstances. So as that occurs, you're actually going to start, if, and, and that's one reason that we set it at both at the same interest rate there uh, initially, just to make it, you know, so so you don't get in an argument about that. But if but if someone feels like yeah, rates are going up in the future, having a mortgage is actually a fixed rate mortgage in particular is a pretty smart thing to do if you're going to use this strategy because that rate is not going to change, but the rate of return on your large sum of money is going to change and hopefully uh, in the right direction, which is going to even create more of an advantage from a net worth standpoint. So that's just a little piece there. If you've got a financial advisor that's advising his clients that way, that's probably something you want to bring out as a part of the presentation to support their view there. That's a great point. Thank you, Jim. Now that also leads into another, another topic inside edge. And, you know, as Jim was talking about, this this may increase. So what happens if you want to actually change this on the fly for your client? Now the way you can do that, there's two ways. Uh, one, you could add two additional products. You could do another buy with cash and another 20% down 30 fixed and use a higher rate of return on those ones so the client can see what it would do. And the easy way to do this, I'll show you because we can do it very quickly, is add another product and we'll call this one cash at let's say 5%. I'm going to use the copy from button to do the buy with cash. And as you can see, the copy pulled everything in for me, so I don't need to do anything more on that product. But I'm going to add one additional product here, and I'm going to call this one mortgage return 5%. And I will copy the 20% down. Hit OK. And notice I'm not changing the rate on the interest rate. All I'm going to do is I'm going to change the rate of return on the investments when I get to the analysis screen. So at that point, I'll hit Adjust Reinvestment Strategy. 
And instead of 4% down here, I'm going to use 5% for both. So again, still using that apples to apples approach of, you know, what happens if it was at a higher rate? What kind of what kind of uh, return could you expect on it? And you can see it's not too terribly different here. You could potentially go even higher if you were to have that that conversation about inflation and decide that, you know what, it, it might potentially go to 6%. You you could you could play with this, but you know, Jim brought up a really good point is and that's this this particular presentation can be very manipulative sounding if it's not done right. And the key to it is try and stay fair on both sides. You know, um, while they might be able to get a better rate of return on a larger chunk of cash than they can on a monthly investment, we can't guarantee that. And, and we certainly don't want to represent ourselves as financial planners. We want to make sure the conversation talks about the possibilities of what can happen in the future. So let's take a look at what happened to our net worth over time. And, when we and, went, uh, Jacob, real real quickly to insert one of the way one of the techniques I use is I'll put that rate of return, say four percent or whatever, and I'll always just ask them, "Do you think that's a fair number?" And just let them say, "What? No, I think it ought to be six. Okay, good. We'll put six in. What? You know, whatever they say, or no, we think it ought to be three. Okay, well, whatever. But, you know, just whatever they say. But I give them an opportunity to come up with that number on their own. Oh, that's a great idea. That's perfect. Thank you, Jim. All right, so now that we've got these these new products in here, these are the 5% rate of return options. You can see that they look roughly the same as our original options did. There's not a whole lot of difference between the 4% rate of return and the 5%, but it does show them that, hey, no matter what we use, we're using it uniformly, and either way, you're going to end up with a lot more liquidity on the mortgage option. So, you know, it as Jim was saying, you know, this is this is your hedge. This is what you can use to ensure that your 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 cash stays stable. I mean, in a market where, you know, we got inflation, we've got potential problems with 401ks and such, then a fixed rate mortgage is a stable way to ensure that your equity is going to continue to grow. And it's going to, it's going to make sure that your rate's going to stay the same. So Jim, would you ever position this type of presentation with an adjustable mortgage? Um, yeah, I mean, sure. You know, it's, it's that the only thing about it is, you know, and, and I don't know that I personally, and I don't know how you guys do it, but personally, I don't know that I would try to do both of these things in, at the same time. I mean, I think you, I think what this is doing is is doing a real good job of showing mortgage versus no mortgage and the drivers there. If you then introduce the variable of an adjustable rate, then that's a whole nother set of um, kind of assumptions that you're going to have to introduce into the situation. So on this one, we're assuming a rate of return. Now, then we'd have to assume a rate of return and assume some kind of adjustment framework for the future. Uh, you know, I don't know if that doesn't confuse the issue a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of adjustable rate mortgages. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'd try to do them both in the same discussion. Uh, it kind of depends on the type of mortgage, I guess. Yeah, totally agree. That's that's kind of where I was going to is that we can't really predict exactly what an adjustable rate mortgage is going to do. I mean, we have we have some ideas of what historic trends are for the different indices. However, we we can't say for certain exactly what that mortgage is going to do over time. So, if you were to do this using adjustable rate mortgages, what I would tell you is when you're looking at the long-term length of time, keep it within the fixed period. That's the best way you can ensure that what you're saying is absolutely accurate. That rate is not going to change during the fixed period. So if you were looking at seven one arms versus cash, you would make your net worth seven years. And realistically, if your borrower asks you about, you know, going past that point, you know, there's certainly a conversation you could have about adjustable rate mortgages, about, you know, what are the potential uh, pitfalls of that and what are the potential advantages? And you could formulate that plan of action. I mean, maybe the plan is to refi out of that mortgage uh, just before that fixed period ends. But it leads to, to further consultation. And that's what you want. You want to be the consultative loan officer that, you know, you don't necessarily have to have all the information, but you want to be able to show them everything you can about their, their specific potential scenarios. All right. So with that said, I think uh, I think we'll go ahead and end the cash versus mortgage part of this, and I'm going to open it up for questions. So if anybody has any questions, I don't want to keep I don't want to keep Jim too much longer on the line here. Uh, maybe another five to ten minutes. So if you have questions for Jim that you'd like him to address uh, directly, please type them into the questions area of your GoToMeeting toolbar, and I'll make sure that uh, I'll make sure that those are relayed to Jim. 
So while that's going on, if you guys are typing right now, I think I'm going to transition today and uh, we're going to show, let's see. So we, we actually, you know what, let's show a, uh, a rent versus own because rent versus owns, you know, I got to tell you, there's a lot of confusion around them and people have a, a tough time understanding some of the metrics that are involved in uh, not only the net worth calculations, but also in the net monthly payment. So um, I'm still waiting on some questions. If anybody has anything for Jim, please do type those in. And for now, I'm going to start a brand new renter. And at Jim, Jim, it looks like our question box is dry right now. So uh, I know that I do want to respect your time, and I really appreciate you coming on with us today. Uh, if you need to jump off, I totally understand. I can take it from here, and we can do a rent versus own. But feel free to stay on if you'd like to add additional color. Great. Hey, thanks a lot, Jacob. All right. Thank you, Jim. Bye. All right, so let's get into our rent versus zone. And uh, when you're doing a rent versus zone, basically when you start off in Edge, one of the things that Edge is asking you for is what direction do we need to go with this presentation? Now, the whole reason we've created this in a wizard format is so it asks you the right questions so that you can continue forward and get to that final step that says, oh, this is the type of report we need to go to. Now, part of it, obviously, we want to enter our, our first and last name. So this is going to be John Renter. And the trigger for a rent versus own is this question right here. Does the person own or rent? When you select rent, Edge is automatically going to guide you through a rent versus own presentation. But when you get to the end, you still do have the ability to select a total cost analysis. So you can prepare both reports for your client based on just one Edge presentation. So I'll show you how to do that in just a moment here. But I wanted to make you aware of how important this switch is. Now, if you're just doing a total cost analysis for somebody and you don't want a rent versus own, but the person really doesn't own yet, what do you choose? Do you choose own? Do you choose rent? What you would do in that case is choose own, and then when you get to the per when you get to the goals section, you're going to choose a purchase goal. So it just walks them through a purchase instead of trying to do a refinance. So we'll do it as a renter today because I do want to show you what the variables are that go forward here. And you notice we ask you for the referral. You know, um, I'll call this Realtor1 is the person who referred me. And then that partner's email, if you want your partner to receive notifications when uh, when your presentation is viewed, just like you do through your rate watch and through email, uh, your partner can receive emails on when this presentation is viewed. But in order to enable that, you've got to make sure to enter your partner email here. So this one, I'll just do it at Realtor at Realtor.com. And friendly name, remember, this is a nickname for your, your report presentation. This is not so much a nickname for your borrower. Uh, so I wouldn't type something here like goes by Johnny Boy. Uh, instead, this is what is this presentation so you can identify it later. And I'm going to put RVO for primary. Now, my next step is choose one of the goals. Now, as a renter, you get slightly different goals than you do as a, uh, a homeowner. So you've got things like get my first home, support my retirements, you know, purchase an investment property, improve my tax situation. These are all questions that you should be asking renters when you're talking about home ownership options. So, for instance, let's say that uh, the idea here is they want to improve their tax situation. So we're going to go ahead and tick that box. And now Edge is going to ask us for some basics on what their rent is and what you predict the annual increase would be. Now, when you're looking at this, obviously the rent, you're just going to ask them, what are you paying for rent? And okay, they're paying $2,000 for rent, but then they tell you, you know, they're, they're also paying $15 a month for monthly rental insurance. Okay, so their total rental payment is going to be 2015. Now for the annual rent increase, I like to use 3% here. 3% is a pretty standard increase amount, and it's also going to be the same percentage I'm going to use when I get to my analysis screen to, uh, to show them what the, uh, the, the home appreciation will be. So I like getting it apples to apples there, so there's no questions. And uh, the final part here is, do they have other monthly rental expenses? Yes or no. If, if you want to type something in there, you can. That's going to add to the rent payment. But the last one, and this is the part that leads to confusion for a lot of people, on the rent versus own, you have the ability to show the tax benefit on the rent side. Now, the only tax benefit they can possibly have as a renter here, at least in terms of the scope of what we're looking at for mortgages, is they're, they're going to have a standard deduction that they can take. Even if they don't have a mortgage, they're still going to get a standard deduction. Now, if you don't know the borrower's standard deduction, you can actually find it by hitting find standard deduction. 
This will open up a new tab for you, and it's going to ask you a few questions. It'll drive you through kind of a wizard format to find out exactly how much the standard deduction would be for your client. So it'll ask you thing about it'll ask you things about the filing status, have they moved in the middle of the year, that kind of stuff. Uh, but once you once you get through this, and really it says five minutes, but I, I'll tell you, it takes me about forty five seconds to get through these. Um, once you get through this, you'll end up with a solid number to use for your standard deduction. So let's say this guy was uh, just filing single, um, but has about a $6,100 standard deduction. Now what this is going to result in is on the rent side, we are going to see that standard deduction being applied as tax benefit going forward. If you don't want to see a tax benefit on the rent side, simply do not enter a standard deduction in this field and you won't get one. The next step is affordability. This becomes particularly important for renters because with renters, we need to get a really solid picture of what their finances look like, how much money they have for down payments, what they can afford, and we want to ensure that they're going to conform to the guidelines for the specific programs that we're discussing with them. So I like, even though this is not read, I like to collect all this information when I'm talking to my borrower or my, my prospect on the phone. Uh, so for instance, let's say he's making 75 grand. And credit status, you notice we don't ask for a FICO score here. We have good, bad, or excellent. This is the question for your borrower. How do you feel about your credit score? Not, did somebody just run your credit? This is this is actually meant to be positioned pre-GFE. Now, you can, of course, revisit the presentation all the way through the loan process. But the idea here is you want to have a good, solid base for determining what products are going to work for them. So ask your borrower, you know, how do you feel about your credit? Well, you know, it's pretty good. All right. I don't need a number. I just need to know what you think it is. We'll run credit later when we do the application process. But for now, I want to show you what loans are going to look like against each other before we even make that decision to move forward farther and, you know, get into all the applications. Now, you're going to need to find out their non-mortgage debt. This is going to be important because Edge just, it does generate the, the DTI ratios for you. So if I find out he's got 15 grand in debt because he's got a car that he just purchased, and his payment on that one is about $400 a month, I'm going to enter those in there. And you're going to see that when we get to our product screen, we are going to see the DTI information. We'll see both ratios, actually, the housing and total. Now, savings balance, this is what do they currently have in the bank? How much money do they have? And, of course, this leads to another question is how much, how much money do you really want to spend on a down payment for your mortgage and still feel comfortable with what you have left in the bank? So let's say my borrower has 25 grand in the bank and he's getting half a percent rate of return on that, on that savings account. Now, when you are showing tax benefit on the presentation, you must enter a tax bracket. This is the only way Edge is going to know what kind of benefit to apply to not only the mortgage interest, but what to apply to that standard deduction. Now, if you don't know your client's tax bracket, I know this guy's making 75 grand and he's filing single. I can find his tax bracket by hitting find tax bracket. And you can see tax year 2014, filing status is single. If I look for where $75,000 falls in, it falls into this category right here, which is the 25% tax bracket. So I'm going to jump back over to Edge and pop in my 25% there. Now, as you move forward, this is another great question. You know, just after you've asked them, you know, how much money can you legitimately spend out of your savings account and still have enough to feel comfortable? The next question is, what's the maximum mortgage payment you want to make? When we're looking at your monthly, your, your monthly cash flow, what can you get away with and still feel comfortable with being able to pay the rest of your bills, being able to support, you know, your kids, your family, um, being able to support, you know, even investment accounts, retirement accounts. I mean, are we are we telling them that you're going to you're going to put all this money into the mortgage and you're not going to put anything away anymore? I mean, that would be that would be kind of careless. So we need to make sure that we isolate where their minimums and maximums are of their comfort levels. So as you're asking these questions, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You know, what's what's the max you want to pay for a mortgage? Well, they're paying 2015 for rent right now. You can probably get up to twenty five hundred dollars before it starts becoming a bit of a problem. Uh, ideal mortgage payment. Well, I'd prefer to pay you know under two thousand if I can, but I think two thousand is probably okay. And then, what's the general price range that they're considering? You know, are we are we looking at a three hundred thousand dollar house, or are we looking at a you know half a million dollar house? And is that feasible with what they've told us they want for a mortgage payment? So let's put in something like uh, my range is going to be two fifty to three hundred.
now we get into new products and as soon as we get some new product info in here we're gonna start seeing the DTI uh, levels are gonna come out so I'm gonna do just a very simple 10% down and I will do this one uh, with MI now for those of you who are on the success uh, strategies calls yesterday I actually did show a very similar situation here I'm gonna throw a variation at you though so if you uh, if you saw the one yesterday pay attention and you'll, you'll see something a little bit different on this on this particular one so my 10% my down with MI I'm going to put in my purchase price remember they said anywhere from 250 to 3 so let's start with 275 and I'm going to enter my 10% down, pop in the interest rate and the term that I can get them. Oops, that's a little too long. And look what happened when I hit the right arrow. You're now seeing on the, on the right side of the, of the screen here, we've got both the DTI ratios. This is housing. This is total debt ratio. And then we've got the loan to value. So uh, a lot of people don't know these are on the presentation. So I kind of have to point these out every once in a while for people. But these are excellent for helping you qualify your borrower. Now I can see from these DTI ratios, they're not going to have any problems at all. Um, obviously, they probably have more liability debt than what I put in there. So this, this total debt ratio might be a little bit higher. But they're certainly going to fall within the guidelines. I mean, I'm staying under 42, so we should be just fine. And I've made sure that uh, my LTV is correct. You know, if I input a dollar amount back in this uh, in this first screen, instead of doing a percentage, you know, what if I put in 248 here? Well, it's going to be 90.03%, which guess what? That might be a pricing hit. So just be very cognizant about what this says over on the right here. Now, the next step is, of course, apply your closing costs. And you have the option for you brand new users who have not yet created templates. If you're just getting into this and you kind of want to just put something out there, feel free to use these ballpark fees. These, these fields, you can put whatever you want in here. So if you know that, for instance, on a $275,000 uh, house, you're probably going to have about $2,000 in APR costs. You're going to assess 15 days of prepaid interest. You've got about $1,000 in prepaid uh, reserves and uh, maybe about $1,500 of non-APR costs. Now, if there was a seller or lender contribution, you could put that in here as well. And what it'll do is it literally subtracts whatever amount you have here from the cash to close. But it does not subtract it from APR costs. So if your, if your credit or your uh, concession is supposed to go against APR costs, you would need to do that inside the closing cost detail. But for today's discussion, I'm going to say that uh, you know I've got a seller concession of $3,000 to help with closing costs. The next step, of course, you want to add in your monthly hazard and taxes. And then for this one, this one does have MI. I'm going to show them one with no MI in just a moment, but let's go ahead and put in a factor for what we can get there. Now for a conventional loan, all we need is the MI cutoff percentage. Uh, the government loans are the ones that require the, the minimum amount of months. So we can leave the, the MI cutoff month blank. And we definitely don't want to check the Calc MI on balance box. That is only for government loans. Currently, MI is not tax deductible for this year. So um, we're going to leave that unchecked. Now, the variation on this is if this was an investment property and they had MI, they could write this MI off. So uh, if you're doing investment, you could potentially make this part of the tax benefit as well. Now, you'll notice that because I use those ballpark fees, instead of doing my closing cost detail, it is grayed out the reserves line. And the reason is it has nowhere to put them. We're, we're not putting them back into line items because all your costs are outside the line items. So I'm going to add a second product here. And this one's going to be, same thing, 10% down. And this one's going to be no MI. And I'm going to use that copy button. I'm going to copy my 10% down with MI product. Now the difference here is I'm going to raise the rate a little bit so that I can use a lender credit to cover the monthly MI. So let's say 4.875, actually probably closer to 5 would be more realistic. And because I use the copy button, all my ballpark fees came over with me. I don't have to do anything there. And my monthly costs came over. So all I need to do now is get rid of my monthly MI. And you can do that quick way is just hit the button here to toggle it back and forth and it'll zero it out. Now next step is let's show a couple of other types of products. We're going to show a single premium finance product. So let's go with uh, single premium. 
Now what a single premium MI product does is it allows you to do one of two things. Either you can have the borrower bring in a single premium and usually it's about two and a quarter uh, percent. Uh, they would bring that in at close and effectively buy out of the MI. And it's, it's a great process. It's certainly worth doing. Um, what I find is having a little bit more success lately, just from what I'm hearing in the trenches, is that people are asking the seller to cover that single premium. Now, when you're doing a 90% loan, it, it's not a problem. Your seller won't, you know, you don't have any guideline restrictions that stop your, your seller from covering a 2.25%. However, one thing to watch out for is if you're doing a 95% loan, you're now capped at 97% with that seller concession. So he can only contribute 2%, which means you've still got a quarter percent that you've got to call for from the borrower. For today's discussion, however, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to leave this at a 90% loan to value. So we do have room. So we're not going to exceed guideline protocols. Now, in order to do a single premium, you need an area to enter that premium. The easiest way to do this, toggle the FHA question. Yes, this is an FHA program. And what I'm going to do first, actually, is I'm going to copy my 10% down no MI product. Then I'm going to flip the switch. So let's flip it over to yes, it is an FHA loan. And let's say that uh, for this one, we'll go with that 4.5% that we had on the with MI product. The difference here is that while it copied over the closing costs, we now have an upfront MIP category. Now I'm going to go ahead and enter it as a percentage so I don't have to calculate it out. Now, this is where you get to decide who's paying for this. If you're going to leave it as borrower paid, borrower paid would be fine here, but what it's going to do is it's going to call for that extra $5,500 at close. Now, you could potentially roll some of this into the loan amount. So for instance, because I'm at the 90% level, I can actually roll all of it into the loan amount and have it financed in. So my total amount finance will be 90% plus this guy. But watch out for pricing hits when you do that, because when you exceed certain points in your, uh, in your LTV, there might be an additional pricing hit for it. Now, the other option is you can have the seller cover it. So this will be called for at close, but what you would do is increase your contribution so it's enough to cover it. So 5568. And now my seller is contributing just enough to cover that single premium, which means my borrower is only going to be responsible for these regular costs. So this one, I'm going to leave it as seller covered. Now, my monthly hazard and taxes came over. Of course, I don't need mortgage insurance on this one. So I've, uh, I've got a pretty solid product here. And let's change the name on this because I want to, I want to indicate that this is seller covered. Now I'm going to add one final product and I'll use the copy from button and I'm going to copy that single premium and I would call this single premium again. And this one is going to be lender paid. So what happens if the lender wants to cover that premium? Well, what can I do as a lender to make that happen? I can boost the rate. So I'm going to bring it up to, let's say uh, five and an eighth. And then that contribution, you notice here, it doesn't ask who the contribution is coming from. So we're actually going to leave this exactly the same as it is. So as I go through it, all the, all the figures are, are the same. The only difference here is I had to use a slightly higher rate for this one to make it happen. So we've got four different options here. We've got 10% down with MI. We've got a 10% down no MI, which is, of course, a little bit higher rate. We've got a single premium buyout color covered by the seller. Then we've got a single premium buyout covered by the lender by raising the rate to cover it. Let's take a look at what they look like in our analysis screen. Now, obviously, our rent category is it's the one that we want it sticking out, saying to the client, look, if you continue to rent, you're throwing money away. That's why this is always in red. How much rent are you paying? Well, you're losing $450,000 over a 15-year period of time to rent. Over the five-year period of time, $128,000. Now, the reason we stack it up next to things like principal paid, you know, you can throw away $128,000 or you can make your mortgage payment and you will have accrued $21,800 in equity. And that's going to actually grow. So as it's appreciating at 3%, your equity is actually a little bit higher than 
the amount of principal that you've paid. So you're retaining this instead of throwing it away like the red ones do. Now you have several different options on what type of analyses you can show. So you have the option of rent versus principal paid, which is always, it's a great comparison. You have rent versus tax benefit, which just shows the total rent and then the total tax benefit of each one of the mortgage options. This is kind of a toughie to explain sometimes, but it's a valid comparison, so feel free to use it. You might even want to toggle between them as you're, as you're doing these presentations. The one I like the best is the tax benefit analysis. And the reason I like this one is because I'm an apples to apples guy. If I don't see that things are equal on both sides of the equation, I start asking questions as to why in the world is it shown that way? So if I'm a borrower and I'm looking at the options for renting a home and buying a home, and I, I really want to look at the tax benefit because that was my initial goal, I want to see what kind of tax benefit I have right now and compare it to what I will have. That seems to make the most sense to me. Now, when we hover over these, you can see that the rent side has a tax benefit, $7,625. That's over a five-year period of time using the standard deduction each year. Now, the home ownership options, obviously, they're going to be significantly greater. You have the ability to write off the interest that you're, that you're paying every year. So there's a couple of different factors that come into play on the tax analysis. Uh, if you want the actual equation behind the tax bracket, click on Help. This will open our knowledge base and then just type in tax bracket. And you can see the top option here is how is the tax benefit calculated? And this gives you the actual equation. So tax bracket times monthly interest plus tax bracket times monthly property tax. And if you made the MI deductible, it would also do tax bracket times MI. Then it add those figures together to give you a total tax benefit. Now, there's other parts that can come into play. If you're talking about the mortgage credit certificate, which is also available in EDGE, your tax bracket would also include a certain chunk of that interest being used for the credit certificate and then the rest being used for the regular deduction. All right, so let's get to our long-term section real quick, and then we're going to open up the physical report. We're going to take a look at it, and I'm going to show you how to explain each one of the quadrants because it's pretty important to know what all of them are saying. Uh, just in case somebody has questions. Now, three metrics on the right here that you have options on. You can do total principal paid. It's kind of the same thing as when we chose rent versus principal paid in the short term. You can choose total net worth, which I really dig total net worth because this one is, again, it's that apples to apples look. You have money in the bank right now as a renter. I, you know, I said it earlier in the affordability section, you have 25 grand in the bank. It's going to continue growing at a half a percent. So if you chose to continue renting, what does your net worth look, at, look like at the 15 year point? Well, you'll have 26.9 in the bank because that money will continue to grow. But again, it begs the question over the 15 year point, wouldn't you want to use that money for something else at some point? Probably. So we can't guarantee that that money is still going to be there. However, if you're diligent about it, your, your money would still be there at 26.9. Now, obviously, the home ownership sides, the net worth, you can see just visually, it's much greater for all the home ownership options. And the reason is, of course, net worth on the home ownership side is a combination of whatever liquid assets they have left after close and any equity they've gained over this period of time. And you can see 264,513, that's mainly a result of the equity that they've been paying into, the principal that they're paying, and then, of course, the appreciation rate that we're using up here. Now, the third option is total interest in MI paid. This is always a great one to show your client. It does show rent here. We're showing a negative 449. That's basically, you know, what are your what are your real costs between these two ones? This is another apples to apples approach. You know, the rent is going to cost you 450. The home ownership options, these are the real costs, interest in MI. It's going to cost you 155, 460. Now, we don't include principal in here because principal is being it's being retained in the form of equity. So our discussion here is what are the unrecoverable costs on each side? Now again, I like net worth, so I'm going to keep it on net worth for now. And then let's get straight to the presentation. And I'm not going to check send edge view alert to the partner, but I do want to show you where that's at, um, primarily because I used a bogus email address and I really don't need to be triggering a bunch of bounces. But um, if you do enter your partner's email address in there, you can have edge view alert sent to that partner. Now, one thing I will bring to your attention is make sure and ask the borrower if it's okay. 
you know, most times, nine times out of 10, they're not going to have a problem with it. But if they're shopping with a couple of different realtors, you might end up causing an issue by notifying only the one that you know about. So just keep it in mind, ask your borrower, hey, is it okay if I include your realtor in the process here? So he's aware of the different fin financing options that are available. And, you know, like I said, nine times out of 10, they're going to say, oh, yeah, absolutely. Let's make sure everybody's on the same page. But you might run across a guy who's who's shopping out and he doesn't want Realtor 1 to know about Realtor 2 and certainly doesn't want to give either one an unfair advantage. In that case, just uncheck the box here. Don't send any alerts to the partner. Now, make sure you've got a quote date anytime you have a rate. And uh, this is anywhere you put it. Anytime you've got a rate somewhere that is associated with a mortgage payment, you got to make sure you got a date on it. This is just going to make sure that you're covered in the event that somebody revisits this report down the line and says, hey, you quoted me four and a half percent. How come that's no longer available? Well, that was tied to a date, my friend. It was that was on 619. You know, it's now August 5th and rates went up a half a point. So I can no longer do that for you. So let's preview this presentation. Let's see what it looks like. All right, kind of busy, kind of busy. We've got lots of graphs, lots of big stuff on the screen, but there's lots of information that you really need to be aware of. Now, on the rent versus own, there's two types of payments that are shown. There are the total payments, which are pity payments. That's these guys right here. And you should be aware of where these are because you're going to get questions about this graphic on the right. These are net monthly payments. Now, the net monthly payment, the way we derive this is we take the pity payment, we subtract out the tax benefit, and we subtract out the principal paid. Now we're arriving at just a net monthly cost of 1,088. So you can see when we're looking at these against each other on the rent side, they've got a 2015 rent. They are maintaining $127 tax benefit. And that's basically by taking the annual tax benefit and dividing it by 12. We subtract that out and their net monthly rent payment is 1888. So now we've got a valid comparison of what are your unrecoverable costs on each type of transaction? Now, obviously, it is going to cost you money to close. You know, it's going to cost you about 30 grand. So at this point, this is actually a red flag. My client told me he has 25 grand in the bank, and it's going to cost him a minimum of 29.4 to close these. So at this point, I'd be asking the client about gift funds. I'd be asking them if they have alternate assets that they can use for this. Uh, or you know you may want to you may want to go with uh, a lesser down payment option. Maybe you maybe you take a look at the five percent down option and see if that's going to be a viable uh, option for your client. But if they say you know what uh, no I can definitely get this don't worry about it and they can source the money <laughs> that's always important for the underwriters. Uh, you can jump back over to Edge and go straight back into the affordability and tag it with whatever you think they've actually got. Now, my uh, my my highest cash to close on my presentation was about 32, so I'm going to make this $33,000. Going to assume they have enough to close any of these transactions. Now, when we do that, that's obviously going to make our net worth on the rent side a little bit higher. You can see it, it rose up to 35,570 because that's $33,000 growing over time. But my net worth on the home ownership side, it's exactly the same. We're uh, we're basically just we're pulling this cash to close out of their existing savings account. They'll have a couple thousand left in it. That's going to grow at that uh, very minor percentage rate. But in the end, the real crux of the net worth here is going to be their equity. All right. So you've got a handle on what the payments are. You've got a handle on how the net monthly payments are generated. Now, one thing I want to draw your attention to is the net monthly payments are the ones shown in the graph on the right here. So when your client's asking you what these represent, you want to drive their attention to the left side. You want to start with the pity payment. You want to have the exact same discussion I did with you just a moment ago. We're taking a look at just the unrecoverable costs between each of these scenarios. On the rent side, you start by paying 2015, but you do have a tax benefit of 127 per month. That means your net monthly payment is 1888. On the home ownership side, You've got a payment of $17.75. This is all cash flow. This top yellow line here is how much it's going to cost you out of pocket. The question is how much of that is a cost versus how much of it is actually an investment that you're going to get a return on. That's why these other figures are being subtracted out. So we're starting with your pity payment of $17.75. We're subtracting out that $304 in tax benefit that you get. And we're subtracting out the principal paid. And again, this is month one. That, that ends up with an 1146 payment here. And going forward, you don't necessarily have to do it for every single column, but just make sure that they're aware that 
these are these are looking at the same things. They're looking at a total cost minus any benefit you're getting. Now, the last part, of course, you want to make sure and draw your client's attention to the cash to close for each one. Ensure they have enough to, to cover it. Uh, if you're doing an uh, ARM proposal, uh, make sure you draw their attention to the payment stream because the payment stream is going to show them the different predicted adjustments that you have in the system. Now, that, of course, should be a red flag for you. If you pop open a payment stream button and it's on an ARM and you don't see any adjustments, you probably forgot to put in a lot of the caps and adjustment parameters. So you might need to go back into Edge and either put those in or realistically, if you're not going to put them in, it's a fixed loan. You might as well just make it fixed at that point. But that should be a red flag for you. You, you know, for compliance purposes, anytime you call something an arm, you absolutely need to show a worst case scenario for it. That's what this payment stream is for. So keep that in mind. Make sure to draw your client's attention to it and use it to check your work. Uh, the other thing you'll find is if you're doing FHA loans, any government loans that have declining MI, you're going to find that every 12 months that, that MI payment actually drops. So you're going to have adjustments every 12 months, so different varying amounts of payments until the loan is paid off. Uh, but if you don't have those and you're looking at an FHA loan, you probably forgot to check that Calc MI on balance box. Uh, conventional loans, this is exactly how it should look. 359 payments at one amount and then a true and final payment. All right, so... The other thing in the top left quadrant is just like in the total cost, you have a more info section, which will drill down the details. It just helps you spell it out to your client in terms of what do these monthly mortgage payments look like? How are they broken down? You can see one, only one of them has mortgage insurance on it. It is, of course, the highest cost between all three of them. And the reason is the MI. So this leads to your discussion of, okay, here's an option you can get without any additional help. I've got three other options for you where I can either build it into your rate or I can ask it from the seller or, you know, build it into your rate for a single premium here. I mean, all three options are, are great functional options to get out of MI. And that's what the discussion would be on these three new ones. The next step is closing costs. Now, remember, we do these as ballpark fees. However, had you done them as line items, you'd actually see a button under each one of these uh, columns that says fee details. And when they click on fee details, it's going to show them all the line items that you entered. Last part is the reinvestment grid. Now, for a rent versus own, you can, of course, schedule reinvestments if you want. I don't like to do it on a rent versus own because I think it tends to muddy the water just a little bit. Um, when we're looking at this, I think probably the, the most crucial part on, on this particular strategy or this particular page is going to be the MI cutoff point. I want to show them that, hey, this one with MI that we're talking about, it's not for the life of the loan. It's only for seven and a quarter years. After that point, it's going to cut off and you're not going to be responsible for that anymore. So that leads into that whole conversation of really what is the total interest in MI you're paying over time? Since Edge is going to cut off your MI in 7.25 years, our long term, we want to probably push it out, you know, like the 15 year point so we can really see how these loans are, are performing against each other. Now, as we go into the more info section and the top right, so when we go, we're drilling into the net monthly payments here, you can see we isolate the P&I payment for you. So if you just want to look at P&I, we've got that across the board. We do show the, the purchase price, and these ones are the same across the board, of course. And then we'll show the rate, APR, term, the down payment, and the closing costs. So this is your synopsis here. So the uh, the top left summary section, is it's got a lot of detail in it, and it's got some, some, uh, some pretty varied calculations going through it. If you want the cut and dry version, top right more info quadrant is going to give you what you need. We've got everything from the rental increase, the property appreciation percentage, and the tax bracket. Now we get into this lower left section, make sure to remind your clients that they can hover their mouse over any of these graphics and it'll show the amount on them. Now you may have noticed that most of the other presentations we have inside Edge do have the figures right above the graphs. The rent versus zone is the one that we had to change away from that. And the reason was this net worth graph can go negative here. And when it does, it changes where the graphs are, which means you start getting these little ellipses instead of numbers on top of them. We are working on a way to try and battle that going forward. But for now, just make sure and remind your client that they can hover over these and they can see the physical numbers behind each one. They're also available behind the more info section. So if you wanted to drill down in the details, this shows the total payments, principal paid, tax benefit, and then we get a net cost for each one. 
Now when we get into our long term section, this allows us to take a more detailed look at their net worth. You can see that obviously on the rent side, they have paid zero principal, so we're leaving that one open. On all of these new home ownership options, they're paying quite a bit of principal and they've got a much greater tax benefit. So what does that result in a net cost for us? Well, there's your net cost over time, 426 for the rent versus you know 150 to 170 or 160 to 170 for the home ownership options. That's pretty staggering. Not only that, but check out the value. We've now got value going forward at the 15 year point. We're gonna have a significant amount of equity because we're gonna subtract out the loan balance. And these are what's really driving our net worth calculations on the home ownership side. All right, I know we're a little bit late today. Thank you everyone for, for hanging on with me. I hope this was useful for you. If you have questions about this, or if you'd like to revisit this, we do log all of these in our coaching call archive. So if you hit help inside edge, it's gonna take you to our knowledge base. And then there's a link up at the top to click here to access our coaching call archive. And you can see that we've got all of them going down. So uh, for instance, yesterday's success strategies, I covered MCC credits and construction loans in detail. So if you'd like to check those out, uh, feel free to click on that one. Uh, within the next couple of hours, I will have today's discussion just beneath this one. Uh, so you'll see Thursday training and it will be covering uh, cash versus mortgage and additional purchase strategies. But with that said, I'm going to let everybody go. Thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful day and contact us to support if we can help in any way. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.